Welcome to module two. We're going to talk about theories of language acquisition. Before we get into the theories of language acquisition, let's talk about the stages of language acquisition. And this is simplified down from your text. From zero to six months, we have the pre-talking stage. Zero to two months is when we vocalize discomfort and reflective sounds. Two to four months, we start uh, expressing comfort sounds like cooing. And four to six months, we start having laughter. Then we'll go into the babbling stage. This is six to eight months. This is vocal play. We often repeat sounds like ba 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 ma ma ma, which don't have meaning to the child. But positive reactions to these noises start to give them meaning. Think ma ma and papa or da da. The parents will hear these sounds and have a very positive reaction, which the kid and the child realizes is a good thing, so they'll keep making these sounds. Then, starting around nine months, we'll acquire morphology, syntax, and word meaning. So we'll start at the holistic state, holophr holophrasic stage, which is a one multipurpose word. Cookie means, can I have a cookie? Then we go into the two-word stage, the telegraphic stage. These are sentence structures that are lexical, but not particularly grammatical, duck and water. And then, starting around 30-plus months, grammatical structures emerge. Oftentimes, parents will become concerned and say their child is regr regressing in their language development, but it's not true. They're acquiring grammatical rules. Children oftentimes will worry, or parents will often worry their child went from saying something like, I went potty to I goed potty. We have to remember the child originally learned went as a functional chunk, not as an irregular verb. Then the child subconsciously discovered the pattern of the ED for the past tense marker and is now overgeneralizing the rules. The child's not regressing, they're just acquiring the grammar, and they will figure out the irregulars as they continue on and receive feedback. Empiricism versus nativism is a common debate in the linguistic field, and these are psychology terms that have often been used to describe the continuum for language learning. It's become less of a debate more frequently. Empiricism is the idea that the brain is a blank slate, the tabula rosa, and that has the ability for learning, but it doesn't contain any contents. So example, you like the color red because you've learned through prior encounters that red is preferential. Nativism argues that certain skills or abilities are native and hardwired in the brain. Example, you like red because you were born liking red. So now let's discuss some first language acquisition theories. The behaviorists and learning theories were Watson, Pavlov, and Skinner, and they really began the discussion, and they looked at language as a learned behavior, and they supported this idea through classical conditioning. However, there's a big issues with these theories as children utter novel ideas they've never heard before. This would go against a learned behavior. Children also make mistakes with language and often these mistakes follow patterns. So think back to our example of goad. This isn't compatible with conditioning or language as a learned behavior. The field then moved into linguistic innatus theories and this was Lennonberg and Chomsky. This takes a nativism look at language and language learning does seem to be innately human, but this theory didn't account for enough of the process. So their hypothesis was that languages are pre-programmed in the individuals, languages are innate. And this is supported because humans acquire language, other animals don't. And in situation where there isn't a language, humans will create a language. So hone signs examples from your text this week. It doesn't adequately account for the social aspect of learning a language. Imitation theory is the idea that children learn language by imitating what they have seen or heard. This is not a generally accepted theory. It doesn't account for errors, mental grammar, or novel utterances. The reinforcement theory argues that children learn language because they're praised, rewarded, or otherwise reinforced when they use corrected forms, or we correct them when they use incorrect. This is also not well established in the field because in practice that's not how language is used. Children create their own language rules subconsciously and correction doesn't appear to change them. Cognitive theory is Piaget and this goes more towards the empiricism side of the spectrum. This is the hypothesis that language is part of cognitive development. It's supported in the idea that language is learned at the same timing as many other cognitive aspects that Piaget studied and that children are predisposed to learn patterns. The issues with the cognitive theory is that children learn language even when specific other learning needs exist in cognitive areas, and it doesn't account well enough for the cultural or social aspect of language. The connectionist theories is McLean and Ruminhard. 
Language is acquired through the development of connections in the brain, which are developed through exposure to language. So this is very connected to psycholinguistics. It's supported because we do acquire grammatical rules, and there is some relationship of this theory to the social and cultural aspects of language. The problem is one large study, or many large studies in the field, for example, have studied the past tense. So we'll say to a child, the man is springing, yesterday he blank. The children, according to the connection theory, should say fringed, but they often say frang or fraught, connecting fringe with sing or bring. The social interaction theory, this is Brunner and Gleason, and this argues that language is learned through interaction between the child and the environment, and it's a process of socialization. This is compatible with other theories, and it accounts very well for the social and cultural aspects of language acquisition, but it focuses too heavily on child-directed speech. Those were first language theories, and they've greatly impacted the field of SLA, second language acquisition. But there's additional theories in SLA that have affected the field as well. Discourse theory argues that all relevant text around a message should be considered in order to understand it clearly and universally. So this really connects to the importance of context on visual, written, and oral texts that we have to scaffold for students prior to them being able to understand situations and for children. The information processing theory is a more recent theory that compares the human brain to a computer. The brain is in processing and it's much like a computer. Language is a hierarchical set of skills where higher level components depend on the acquisition of lower level components. Selinker in 1972 presented the concept of inner language with inner language being the second language learner's developing system, both the L2 system of the learner at a given point in time and the series of interlocking systems that develop over time. The emphasis of this theory is on the learner's system in its own right. Swain's output hypothesis was detailed in both 85 and 95 and is hugely impactful on the field. Anyone in TESOL or in foreign language education will have experience with Swain's output hypothesis. Learners need not only comprehensible language input that we'll discuss from Krashen in a moment, they also need to produce output in order to develop communicative abilities in their second language. She based her work on French immersion students in Canada who despite high levels of comprehension, they spent a lot of time in the classroom developing listening and reading skills, they weren't able to produce the language, they weren't able to read or write in the language, even though they could understand the language. So it's really important in our language classrooms that we connect back to Swain's output hypothesis so that students are not just focusing on listening and reading, but also on speaking and writing. They're producing the language. Yeniman has the processing theory and originally uh, linked the developmental stage to learnability and teachability issues, meaning learners have to acquire at a given stage in order to learn the following stage. And this was really one of the first attempts to link second language research to teaching concerns. And in 1998, Pianemann expanded and said that learners process linguistic information in local domains before more distant ones. So we learn the morphology before we learn clauses, before we learn syntax sentences, before we learn discourse. So it builds in a hierarchical fashion. We have to learn certain stages before we can acquire other stages is the real heart of the processing theory. Krashen is another huge name in the foreign language and ESL fields. He has the acquisition learning hypothesis, meaning learning and acquisition are different. Acquisition is subconscious and learning is conscious. That's what we do in the classroom. Part of this was the monitor theory and that learners subconsciously acquire the grammar system of a language. They consciously learn the rules, but this conscious learning has little to do with their production. Until they acquire the rules, they can't produce in a natural way. Learning can be used though, this idea of learning the rules, because they can monitor their own output once they've produced some of the language. Krashen also taught us about the effective filter. So this is variables such as motivation, self-confidence, and anxiety all impact language acquisition. We want students who have high motivation, self-confidence, and a good self-image in combination with a low level of anxiety to produce the best results. So when you're thinking about your language classroom, you really want to think about the language learner's effective filter. Krashen agreed with Kahneman in the, in the idea that uh, the acquisition of grammar follows a natural order that is predictable. 
And Krashen proposed the input hypothesis theory. This means that learners need to be exposed not only to input, but input that is just beyond their current developmental level. So think of this idea as I plus one. So I is where the learner currently is, and plus one is that extra something in terms of input. And Patton went a little beyond Krashen in, their, in his input processing theory, and he focused on the link between L2 acquisition and teaching arguing that learners only process grammar information if they need it in order to understand. So for the example in a sentence, yesterday he played the game, learners can ignore the ED as a past tense marker because yesterday already gave them that information. So we wanna make sure we're facilitating learning environments where it's challenging the students in that idea of I plus one so that they're not reverting back to just I in order to understand, that they're always having to challenge themselves with the plus one. Vygotsky developed the social cultural theory, which has been strongly connected with second language acquisition in the zone of proximal development. So this is the idea that social and cognitive processes are highly impact language learning. Language is an inherent social act. So Vygotsky's sociocultural theory accounts for this. The zone of proximal development highlights the importance between the interaction between a student at their independent ability, this lower level of the VPD, and the student's ability with a more capable interlocutor. So this means with a more knowledgeable peer. So the zone of proximal development is the distance between what the student can do on their own and what the student can do with the help of a more knowledgeable peer. Lantoff then took all of Vygotsky's work in social cultural theory and applied it to second language acquisition, arguing that language is a socially mediated process. We can't acquire language individually. So we need to focus on regulation, scaffolding, ZPD, private and inner speech, and activity theory in order to facilitate the best second language learning environments. Our language learning environments need to not be individualistic. They need to be cooperative. Please let me know if you have any questions on the topic throughout the theories of language acquisition.